Committee on Landmarks, Public Sightings, and Dispositions. At this time, we would like everyone to silence all cell phones and electronic devices to avoid any interruptions. Please, at no point, approach the dais. Chair, we're ready to begin. Good morning. Welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings, and Dispositions. I am Councilmember Sandy Nurse, and I will be act today's acting chair of the subcommittee. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Council Members Brannon and Marte. We will be joined by Council Member Feliz online. Before we begin with today's agenda, I will remind everyone that this meeting is being held in a hybrid format. For members of the public who wish to testify remotely, we ask that you first register online and you may do so now by visiting www.council.nyc.gov slash land use to sign up and then sign into the Zoom and remain signed in until you have testified. For anyone here with us today in person and wishing to testify, if you have not already done so, please see one of our sergeants to fill out a speaker's card and we will call your name at the appropriate time. For anyone wishing to submit written testimony on the items being heard today, we ask that you please send it via email to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov and to please indicate the land use number and or project name in the subject line of your email. On today's agenda, we will have a hearing on land use item number 130, Brooklyn Edison Building and Landmark Designation in Council Member Wrestlers District in Brooklyn. Pre-considered land use item designation of the Willoughby Hart Historic District in Council Member Osei's District in Brooklyn. We will also hold several votes, which we will do as um, soon as we get quorum. So we're gonna pause.
Okay, we're gonna open up a, uh, the first hearing. Uh, now I open up a public hearing for a pre-considered land use item, the proposed designation by the Landmarks Preservation Commission of the Willoughby Hart Historic District and Council Member Osei's District in Brooklyn. Appearing today on this proposal is Stephen Thompson, Landmarks Preservation Commission, Lisa Kersavage, Kersavage? okay. Savage, Landmarks Preservation Commission. Those wishing to testify remotely must register online, as we've already mentioned. Um, uh, thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm going to turn this over to council to administer the affirmation. Apologies. Um, panelists, would you please raise your right hand and state your names for the record? Is the red light? Stephen Thompson. And do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. You may begin. Can we get the slides up for the panelists? Slides are loading. One second, please. Okay. I'd like to recognize Council Member Ressler has joined us. The Zoom host cannot hear the panelists. Give us one second. The slides are out of order in the way that they want to present. So we're going to skip over to the public hearing for Land Use 130, the proposed designation by Landmarks Preservation Commission of the Brooklyn Edison Building in Council Member Ressler's district in Brooklyn as an historic landmark. Um, Council Member Ressler, do you want to say a few words on your on the project? Uh, thank you very much, Chair Nurse. Uh, the Edison Building, uh, 345 Adams, is well known to, uh, I think, probably certainly every member of the City Council from Brooklyn, because that's where the Board of Elections is. Uh, we have a number of city agencies in there. It's a beautiful building, and, you know, downtown Brooklyn has been undergoing dramatic changes in recent decades, and it's important that we continue to recognize and celebrate the rich architectural history of some of the buildings that have made downtown Brooklyn great. Uh, I have been in close communication with the, you know, it's for my colleagues' benefit, this is an unusual, unusual ownership structure of the building uh, where the ground floor spaces, or the first two floors, I believe, were condoed out to um, a developer to make them for dynamic retail spaces, and DCAS, the city, owns the remainder of the building. Uh, it's critically important to me that we preserve the beautiful architecture of this building, and I've been working with some of the civic associations in the area uh, to advance this goal, while also ensuring that the retail spaces can be activated and that we develop an effective plan with LPC uh, while this is under council review uh, to ensure that these retail spaces can be uh, uh, to the benefit of our community. So I have a number of questions, but happy to hear the presentation and, and go from there. And thank you for the chance to comment, Chair Nurse. Thank you. I'll now turn it back to the panelists for your presentation. Good morning, Acting Chair Nurse and Council Members. My name is Lisa Krasavage, and I'm the Executive Director of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on our recent designations. The Brooklyn Edison Building is a distinguished Renaissance Revival-style office building designed by Mackenzie, Voorhees, and Gamellan for the Brooklyn Edison Company and built between 1922 and 1926. Highly visible from Adams Street, 
Columbus Park and Fulton Street, the monumental building is a notable landmark in the civic and commercial center of downtown Brooklyn. Next slide. At the public hearing on June 4th, 2024, three people testified, including representatives of the Downtown Brooklyn Association, Historic Districts Council, who spoke in favor of the designation. The owner of the commercial condominium unit did not oppose designation, but emphasized their concerns about the flexibility in making necessary changes to the commercial storefronts. And the commission also received two letters in support, including from Councilmember Ressler and a representative of the Brooklyn Heights Association. Uh, the Brooklyn Edison building is located at 345 Adams Street on the corner of Willoughby, Pearl, and Adams Street. Next slide. The Edison Electric Illuminating Company of Brooklyn was established in 1889 to provide electricity to the homes and businesses of Brooklyn. After a merger in 1919, the company was formally reorganized as the Brooklyn Edison Company. After the completion of the subway lines in the 1920s, growth in residential development increased the demand for additional electricity capacity in Brooklyn. To answer this demand, the Brooklyn Edison Company required a larger building as its headquarters and commissioned one of the most prominent architectural offices of the era, era Mackenzie, Voorhees, and Gamellan, to design it. Next slide. Located on the prominent corner of Willoughby and Pearl Streets, the Brooklyn Edison Building was designed and constructed in two phases. The first phase took place in 1922 to 23, and the building expanded northwards in 1926, doubling its footprint. Designed in the Renaissance Revival style, the building features a tripartite configuration with a rusticated stone base, brick and stone middle section, and double set back crown, responding to the requirements of the 1916 zoning law. It is richly ornamented with Renaissance Revival style elements, particularly focused at the street level and its roof line. Next slide. Originally located on the southeast corner of its block, during the construction of the Brooklyn Civic Center and the expansion of Adams Street in the 1950s, the western half of the block was removed and the urban setting changed. Following demolition of the adjacent buildings, the ground floors of the Brooklyn Edison Building's west facade became exposed. The building was adapted to the changing streetscape by moving its main entrance to Adams Street in the mid-1960s. In 2009, Commercial Owners Must Development LLC created retail spaces with new storefronts along Adams that interpreted and replicated historic features on Willoughby and Pearl Street with modern materials, activating the street frontage facing the Civic Center. LPC recognizes that these new storefronts are non-historic, which allows flexibility into the future. Next slide. Despite the change to the city grid around it and changes to the, on the lower stories of the west facade, the building retains its historic form and character. Highly visible from many vantage points, it is monumentally and prominent massing incorporating highly intact Renaissance revival style elements is further emphasized after the change in the urban fabric of downtown Brooklyn. Recently, a comprehensive restoration of the building facades was completed under the ownership of DCATS. The building continues to serve as an office building with commercial activities on its first and second floors. Next slide. And the Brooklyn Edison Company was central to the borough's electrification needs and stands as a testament to the transformative impact of technological advancements in electricity production in Brooklyn's urban development. The architecturally and historically significant buildings continues to provide a monumental backdrop to Brooklyn Civic Center with an elaborate design and setback massing that recall the time of construction. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Um, I would now like to recognize any colleagues if you have any questions. Okay, Councilmember Russell. Thank you. Um, thanks so much. Uh, it, you know, it, it's in my lifetime that uh, downtown Brooklyn has changed dramatically. And the presence of the Marriott, the retail spaces on Adams in this building were critical components of kind of the revitalization uh, of. Uh, maybe that's not the perfect word, but we're critical components of kind of a new era of development in downtown Brooklyn. And I, I just have a, a couple kind of related questions. Um, the current owner of the uh, 
kind of condo retail space, must development, removed the facade on the Adam Street side and created a replica to look like the Pearl and Willoughby side of the building. Could you confirm that LPC agrees that the Adam side of the building was the back of the historical building and does not intend to seek any changes or require future repairs that are consistent with the current design? Yes, so it is true that the front of the building was, was on Pearl Street historically, and the urban renewal, as I said, did change um, the views of the building, so it exposed kind of the back. And, you know, as I said, the um, retail was a recreation. We recognize that um, in our, all of the three, um, the hearing in two public meetings to the council members and in our designation report. So that is part of the record. Um, that allows for flexibility for those um, retail storefronts. Our commissioner or our staff um, met with the owner on site. We had um, a really helpful tour of the site. Um, we talked about um, future regulation, the potential of master plans, and and other ways to provide um, you know flexibility, but also um, timeliness in issuing permits for those retail, which we agree really activates that street. That is helpful to hear, but just to to ask the question plainly, recognizing that Adams was the back of the building, you're not intending, LPC is not intending any future repairs that are inconsistent with the current design. Well, the, you know, the, the back of the building is a huge, it's a big building. Yeah. Um, um, and so, you know, it's the upper floors and the ground floor. And the way LPC regulates is, um, you know, we regulate the whole building. Um, but we recognize for storefronts that um, there's often been alterations of base and that storefronts have special needs. So our rules allow for a lot, our staff to issue permits that can be um, expedited, that can be fast. Um, and we, so we recognize the needs of businesses and, I, and talk to I, And I do want to get into the storefront specific issues with you, but I do just want to try to make sure that we're saying the same thing. As a result of urban renewal, Adams kind of became the main entrance for the building as it opened up the Adams Street side and Columbus Park, et cetera. But you're not intending to require future repairs that are inconsistent with the current design with regard to kind of the historical nature of where the original uh, entrance was or anything to that effect. I'm not sure what you mean with inconsistent. Well, um, I, you know, I think we're, you know, I'm certainly happy to see landmark designation that you know maintains the current um, design and structure broadly and can get into the specifics on the retail spaces but sometimes I worry that when we designate a building we then look back to some picture from 1922 and say we need to recreate that picture from 1922 and hold the building owner accountable for a redesign that's going to recreate a 1922 image um, and I'm sure 1922 was a great year in Brooklyn but you know, it, it can feel random. And so I just want to make sure we're not, because the previous entrance of the building was on Pearl Street, not on Adams, we're not going back to some previous design from a different era that we're imposing on this building and saying, you're going to have to recreate this that's inconsistent with the current design. Does that make sense that I say that more plainly? Well, LPC never mandates a certain design. You know, uh, people come with the changes that they want to make to us. Um, and in this case, because we so clearly documented the changes to this building in our designation report, and that's what the commission voted on, we recognize that those um, storefronts on Adams were not historic. We are very clear about that, and that allows for future flexibility um, for those storefronts. But we regulate every building the same. You know, we, we don't, um, it's, it's not a different set of regulations for each building we designate, but um, we never mandate that somebody has to do rest restorative work and in this case although we, I, we if were you were very clear about the the um, need for flexibility and that these building these Great. storefronts had been um, I, recreated I think that sometimes the staff review of exactly this banister or exactly this window frame or whatever the heck it is it can feel like it's a mandate it, you may not use that language and that may not be the way that you think about it but I think for an applicant going through a process they may not feel like they have the latitude that I, it sounds like you're describing in your answer but I I, I do I digress. I, I, well, I don't really. I just wanted to clarify that point. It sounds like we're on the same page. I just want to dig down a little more on the storefront, so if that's okay. Um, 
it's critical we kind of ensure that these stores are able to continue to operate effectively in these spaces. And when there's turnover, we're able, able to fill these spaces and have vibrant, dynamic, mixed-use commercial corridor here. Um, and I think we just want to understand in the creation of kind of a master plan with the uh, owner and with the business, you know, for the, for the storefronts, do you intend to set policies? Are you kind of committed to setting policies around backlit signage, signage size requirements, awning and color requirements, so that those are certainties for the businesses that are coming in and what they need to comply with to be able to, um, uh, uh, you know, understand kind of the um, approvals that are in place for them to be able to kind of set up their facade appropriately. Um, and I think you've said this, but just want to kind of affirm LPC is committed to working with Moss on a new storefront plan that addresses these issues and removes any uncertainty for future tenants. Yeah, we, we talked to the property owner, we met on site, and we talked about master plans, set examples of master plans. And, the, you know, the way those work is that um, it, it is an application from the property owner. It's not something that we can create, but um, it can either be approved by the staff if it meets our staff level rules, um, which, you know, it sounded like most of the um, issues that the property owners are interested in could meet our staff level rules. If they don't, then it would just be reviewed by our commission. Okay. Um, and then it allows for So um, you're not able approval. at this time to like make a commitment that it would be staff level approval for something like this? Not without seeing what the application is, no. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And do you think backlit signage, signage size requirements, on and color requirements are the, are reasonable expectations to have incorporated into the master plan? Those are things that are typically in a master plan, for sure. Okay. Um, well, that's all helpful. I'm appreciative of your patience with me today and your patience in working with Moss. Um, they've been very appreciative of your time and insight and expertise. I know you met with my staff as well, so thank mm -hmm. you for that. Um, I, I think this is a good project and a good designation and good for downtown Brooklyn. I just want to make sure that we have sensible policies in place to protect the commercial storefronts and make sure that we can continue to um, uh, have those as vibrant uh, spaces in our community. So thank you very much and thank you for the time, Chair Nurse. Thank you, Council Member. I'm gonna recognize Council Member um, Oswald Feliz is joining us online. Council Member Salam is here. Um, is there anyone else that has any questions regarding this? Okay, great. So we will Thank you, for, thank you panelists. Um, and we will close this portion of the hearing. Are there any members of the public that would like to testify? Uh, no, there are not. Okay, great. So we're gonna close this part. Thank you so much. Oh, that's right, you're doing too, sorry. All right, so uh, just one second, I wanna see where we are in terms of members. Okay, so I now open the public hearing for pre-considered LU item, the proposed designation by Landmarks Preservation Commission of the Willoughby Hart Historic District in Councilmember Osei's district in Brooklyn. We already went over this a little bit, so I'm going to um, ask the panelists to begin. Okay, and uh, we just need the slides. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, good morning, acting chair nurse and council members. My name is Lisa Krasavage. I am the executive director of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. The Willoughby Hart Historic District, which was designated on June 25th, consists of two blocks of cohesive historic streetscapes with row houses built in the, between the early 1870s and 1890s representing the early development of the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood in the late 19th century. The Willoughby Hart Historic District is lo oh, next slide, please. The Willoughby Hart Historic District, which you can see with the red label, is located in the northwest corner of the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood in the vicinity of the Clinton Hill and Bedford-Stuyvesant Historic Districts. It was identified by LPC in various surveys over many years, and after having designated larger historic districts in the neighborhood, LPC restudied the area and prioritized it for designation. 
In addition to our internal studies, LPC received a request for evaluation from two block associations for a historic district encompassing the area that we had found to merit designation. Next slide. The district is bounded by Nostrand Avenue to the east, Marcy Avenue to the west, Willoughby Avenue to the north, and Hart uh, Street to the south. LPC held three owner information sessions in advance of calendaring and after. At each one, we provided an explanation of why the historic district is significant and answered questions about our review process for typical alterations, including rear yard extensions. We also offered and held many one-on-one -on -one meetings with individual property owners. We also responded to concerns about timing by postponing two public meetings. Throughout the designation process and at our public hearing on Tuesday, June 11th, the commission received written and verbal testimony from property owners, both in support and in opposition of the historic district. Elected official support included Councilmember Ose, State Senator Brisport, New York State Assembly Member Zinnerman. Organization supported, supporting the district included Brooklyn Community Board 3, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, Historic Districts Council, Safe Harlem Now, and others. I will note that the full recording of the testimony is included in the Historic Districts Designation Report. Next slide. The Willoughby Hart Historic District was historically part of a community known as Cripplebush, which developed in the mid 17th century along the historic Cripplebush Road um, that connected the settlement of Bedford Corners to Newtown in Queens, and which we can see in this 1886 map. Um, and the land immediately within the district was later part of Henry Borham's property. Development in this area started slowly in the 1870s with one group of houses on Willoughby that are mostly still intact. The rest of the row houses in the district were designed, constructed, and planned by a small group of builders, owners, and local, local Brooklyn architects such as Thomas E. Greenland, Arthur Taylor, and Isaac Reynolds. As you can see here in the 1880 map in the center and the 1898 map on the left, by the mid-1880s, the blocks had been nearly fully developed, and by 1898, all of the buildings in the district were constructed, which you can see in pink. Next slide. The district is characterized by long, consistent rows of preserved row houses. Many of the early inhabitants of these houses were Jewish immigrants from Russia, many of whom were also local business owners. The homes were owner-occupied until the 1920s, when most were split between multiple families who rented space. By the mid 20th century, the African American community grew here as it did in the larger Bedford Stuyvesant neighborhood. And in 1969, of the 250,000 people living in Bedford Stuyvesant, 80% were black and 10% were Puerto Rican. Next slide. In the, late, or in the 1960s, the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council lobbied Senator Robert F. Kennedy to visit Bedford Stuyvesant and worked with his staff to form the first federally funded community development corporation in the country, the Bedford Stuyvesant Development and Service Corporation, which focused on restoration largely carried out by local men learning skilled trades. Number 485 Willoughby Avenue and the five adjoining row houses were restored as part of this program. Next slide. Shown here is our analysis and, and the dates, the building dates and styles represented in the district. All the row houses were built during the last three decades of the 19th century during a time of transition from farmland to dense residential development. The most common architectural style is neo grec seen throughout the district and employed throughout the phases of development. Row houses featuring a combined combination of neo grec and Second Empire stylistic features are among the earliest buildings constructed. Um, and a row of Romanesque Revival and Queen Anne style houses on Hart Street are among the latest. The consistency in age and style uh, creates a distinctly cohesive streetscape. Next slide. Um, one moment. We're gonna, um, is it okay if we're gonna call for our vote? Sure. Just because we have members who are in other hearings. Um, so we're just gonna pause on the public hearing piece um, we will now vote to approve the designation of the following sites by Landmark Preservation Commission. LU number 129, the designation of the Temple Court, now the Beekman Hotel Atrium in Councilmember Marte's district in Manhattan. LU number 108, the designation of the Heckscher Building, now the Crown Building in Councilmember Powers District in Manhattan. Land use item number 131, the designation of Frederick Douglass Memorial Park in Councilmember Carr's District in Staten Island. Uh, Councilmember Marte, do you 
have anything you want to say? Okay, great. Uh, members of the subcommittee who have questions or remark about today's items, please let me know. I now call for a vote to approve LU 108, 129, and 131. Council, please call the roll. Um, uh, Councilmember Brannon? Aye. Councilmember Feliz, who's online? I don't know if he's able to unmute. Um, Council Member Feliz, online, are you able to give your vote? Um, okay, Council Member Marte? I vote aye. Um, Acting Chair Nurse? I vote aye. Council Member Salam? I vote aye. Um, maybe we leave it open for one minute. Uh, so far with a, a vote of four in favor, um, the items are approved. Do you want to leave the vote open? We can leave it open while the students are talking. Okay. Okay, we'll leave it open, but we'll turn it back to you all. Sorry for the brief intermission. Can we get the slides again? Okay, and here you can see examples of the Second Empire, Neo Grec, and Romanesque revival styles. Next slide. After calendaring, there was permitting activity at DOB that LPC monitored, including resurfacing, rear and rooftop additions, and facade repair. In voting to approve the district, the LPC commissioners were apprised of and considered those permits. Today, the district has good integrity overall with consistent historic streetscapes and minor alterations to some properties that do not detract from the strong historic architectural character, streetscape integrity, and sense of place consistent with similar historic districts. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. One second. Uh, we do have one question. Um, wondering if the homeowners will still be able to make additions to the back of their homes after the historic district is designated. Sure. Our, um, you know, Rooftop and reyard additions are very common applications at the Landworks Commission, um, some of which can even be approved um, by staff, others that go to our commission. Um, so some, if they follow the rules, um, even our staff can just approve them in an expedited fashion. But um, otherwise, you know, we have hearings most Tuesdays and oftentimes rooftop and reyard additions are on the agenda. Um, so it's something that we very commonly see in row house districts such as this one. Okay, um, thank you for that. Are there any remote public participants who wish to testify have not already done so? There are no public, um, there's no members of the public who okay. to testify. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify or members um, regarding the pre-considered LU item for the designation of the Willoughby Hart Historic District, the public hearing is now closed. Thank you so much panelists and sorry for the disruption. Um, the final vote for the land use um, items 108, 129, and 131 is in the affirmative, four in the affirmative, um, and zero extensions, no negative, and all items are referred to the full land use committee. Thank you, Council. That concludes today's business. I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, subcommittee council, land use staff, and the sergeants at arms for your participation today. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>